Welcome to Grade 9, Unit 6 Cyber Class on Probability and Statistics. This is Module 6.1 on Statistical Data. The objectives for this module are to define statistics, to identify discrete and continuous data, to know methods and procedures in collecting and presenting simple statistical data, to calculate mean, mode, median, variance and standard deviation. Types of data. Data is the information that you gather. It could be primary data, which is where you gather it yourself, or secondary data, which is where you look at someone else's data. Qualitative data is based on characteristics whose values are not numbers. For example, what is your favourite pen colour? How do you travel to school? What brand of computer do you own? Quantitative data describes information that can be counted or measured. For example, how many pens do you own? How long does it take you to get to school? Or how many computers have you owned? Quantitative data can be divided into discrete and continuous. A quantitative discrete variable has exact numerical values, e.g. 1, 2, 3, 4. For example, the number of CDs you have or the number of children in your family. A quantitative continuous variable can take any value within a given range, including fractions and decimals. Its accuracy depends on the accuracy of the measuring instrument used. For example, length, weight or time. Statistics is the science of collecting, organising, presenting, analysing and interpreting data in order to draw conclusions. To collect data, you might need to count or measure something. To organise data, you might need to put it in a table edit it or classify it. To present data, you might need to use diagrams and graphs. To analyse data, you might want to look at averages, spread and patterns. And to interpret data, then you need to say what's happened in the context of the original problem. Population and sampling. Population is all the members of the group that we are studying. A sample is a part or a subset of the population or a selection of individuals from the population. Random samples must have two characteristics. Every individual has an equal opportunity of selection and the sample has essentially the same characteristics as the population. Presenting data in frequency tables. A frequency table is an easy way to view your data quickly and look for patterns. For example, a student counted how many cars passed his house in one minute intervals and he did this for 30 minutes and he got these results. It's quite difficult to spot any patterns in this data, so the best thing to do with it is to put it in a table. We can put the different numbers of cars each minute and then count how many times each of those numbers occurred. The different numbers of cars are 20, 21, 22, all the way down to 28. And then if we count how many times each of those numbers occurred, we can put it in the table here, 2, 5, 7, 6, 1, 2, 3, 3, 1. So this top row here means that in two of the minutes, there were 20 cars. And then this row means that in five of the minutes, there were 21 cars. Presenting data in bar charts. Here's the example that we just looked at. We can put this in a bar chart like this. We put the number of cars per minute along the bottom and the frequency up the side. Now the frequency for 20 is 2. So the first bar has a height of 2. Then the frequency for 21 is 5. So the second bar has a height of 5 and so on. The bar chart is really good because it's easy to see which number of cars was the most common. Here's another example. 
The bar chart shows how many minutes it takes for students to return home after school. What's the shortest time that a student could take to get home? We look at the graph. The smallest number of minutes is five. So it's five minutes. B. What percent of the students take more than 20 minutes to get home? For this one, we look at the graph again. It's these students here. There are two here, two here, and one here. So that's five altogether. So the percentage is five out of 16. That's the total number of students times 100, which is 31.25%. Measures of central tendency, mode. A measure of central tendency tells us where the middle of a set of data lies. There are three different ways to measure the central tendency. And first of all, we're going to look at the mode. The mode is the value that occurs most frequently in a set of data. For example, if we wanted to find the mode of this set of data, we'd have to look for the number that occurred the most often. And that's 15 because it occurs three times. Another example, Sarah is in a netball team. The table shows the number of goals scored in each of her matches over a season. What is the modal number of goals? This time we need to look at which number of goals occurred the most often. Well here, one goal was scored seven times and two goals was also scored seven times. So the mode is one and two goals. Median. The median is the number in the middle when the numbers in a set of data are arranged in order of size. For example, find the median of this set of data. First of all, we need to arrange the data in order of size. So starting with two and going up to 55. We then look for the number in the middle by working from the outsides inwards like this. And we get this number, 23. So the median of this set of numbers is 23. If there are an odd number of values, then the median is always one of the original values. But if there are an even number of values, then the median will be the average of the two middle values. So it may not be in the original data set. If we had three data points, A, B and C, then the median would be the second value. There are three data points, so to find the position of the median value, we have to add one to three and then halve it. Three plus one over two, which gives us the second value. And in general, if there are n values, then the middle one will always be in the position of n plus one over two. You always have to add one to the number of points before you halve it. For example, if n equals 25, then we want to find the 25 plus 1 over 2 position, which is 13. So the median is the 13th ordered data value. And if n was 18, we would do 18 plus 1 over 2, which is 9.5. So the median would be the average of the 9th and the 10th ordered data values. Here's an example. Sammy has been counting the number of tracks on the CDs in his collection. Find the median number of tracks on Sammy's CDs. To do this, we need to look at how many CDs there are altogether, which is 3 plus 2 plus 2 plus 1 plus 3 plus 5, which is 16. So then we want to find the 16 plus 1 over 2 position, which is 8.5. So we want to find the 8.5th data value, or the average of the 8th and the 9th values. There are three values here, then another two taking us to five, then another two taking us to seven. So this would be the eighth value and this would be the ninth value. So we want to find the average of 10 and 11 tracks, which is 10 plus 11 over two, which is 10.5 tracks. The mean. The arithmetic mean, usually called the mean or the average, is calculated by taking all the amounts and sharing them out equally. We can write this in a formula. First of all, we add together all the data values and then we share that out between the number of data values. We represent the mean like this with a little bar on the top.
We can also write this as x bar equals the sum of x over n, where the x's are the individual data points. Here's an example. Find the mean of these numbers. For this, we add together all the numbers and then we divide by 7. And this gives us 595 over 7, which is 85. Here's another example. The table shows how many students achieved each grade in their drama exam. Find the mean. Well, we know that the mean is the sum of all the data points divided by how many data points there are. In this case, we want to find the sum of the data points and divide it by the sum of the frequencies. Because the data is listed in a frequency table, we need to be careful when we add up the data points. For example, for this row here, the data point 1 occurs 10 times, so when we add it up, we need to add up 10 ones. We can write this in an extra column in the table. So here we're adding up 10 ones, here we're adding up 19 twos, which is 38, and here we're adding up 10 threes, which is 30. So this column is the frequency multiplied by the data points. So we need to write the formula a little bit differently this time, because this time we're adding up the sum of all the frequencies times by the individual grades, and then dividing by the total frequency. So we need to find the total of this column, which is 78, and divide it by the total for this column, which is 50. So the mean is 78 divided by 50, which is 1.56. So the average grade, or the mean grade, is 1.56. Here's another example. Belay's mathematics test grades are 87, 93, 89 and 85. What score must she get on the fifth test in order to get a mean of 90 for the term? For this one we'll use the formula that the mean is equal to the sum of the data values divided by the number of data values. So in this case the mean is 90 and it's equal to 87 plus 93 plus 89 plus 85 plus the extra value for the fifth test, all divided by 5. So 450 is equal to 354 plus the missing value. And the missing value is 96. She must get a score of 96 on the fifth test. Example. The mean mass of 11 players in a sports team is 80.3 kilograms. A new player joins the team and the mean goes up to 81.2 kilograms. Find the mass of the new player. The mean for the 11 players is equal to the sum of the mass of the 11 players divided by 11. So this means that 80.3 is equal to the sum of the mass of the 11 players divided by 11. So 883.3 is equal to the sum of the mass of the 11 players. So now, if we want to find the mean of the 12 players, then we need the sum of the mass of the 12 players divided by 12. So 81.2, which is the mean for the 12 players, is equal to the sum of the mass of the 11 players, 883.3, plus the mass of the 12th player, all divided by 12. So 883.3 plus x, the missing player, is equal to 974.4 kilograms. So the new player has a mass of 91.1 kilograms. Another example. Helen's mean sales price for 12 computers is 6,000 beer and Fakir sold 13 with a mean of 7,200 beer. Their boss tells them to combine their sales at the end of the week. What is the mean after Fakir and Helen combine their sales? For Helen, the mean is equal to the total sale price divided by 12. So 6,000 is equal to the total sale price divided by 12. And the total sale price is 72,000. For Fakir, the mean is equal to the total sale price divided by 13. So 7,200 is equal to the total sale price divided by 13. So the total sale price for Fakir is 93,600. So overall, the mean is equal to the total sale price for both of them divided by 25, 
which is 72,000 plus 93,600, all divided by 25, which is 6,624 beer. Consider the data set K minus 2, K, K plus 3, and K plus 3. Show that the mean of the data set is equal to K plus 1. Suppose each number in the data set is increased by 2. Find the new mean of the data set in terms of K. For part A, we use the formula that the mean is equal to all of them added together divided by 4. So in this case, K minus 2 plus K plus K plus 3 plus K plus 3, all divided by 4 which is 4k plus 4 divided by 4, which is 4 times k plus 1 divided by 4, which is k plus 1. For part b, if all the data values increase by a, then the mean also increases by a. We're going to come to this soon. So in this case, if all the data points are increased by 2, then the mean is also increased by 2. So it becomes k plus 1 plus 2 which is k plus 3. Properties of the mode. The mode can be used for qualitative data or when asked to choose the most popular item. For example here, it could be used to find the most popular colour out of these triangles. In this example, there are two red and two purple, so the mode may not be unique. The mode is not affected by extreme values. For example, in this data set, the mode would be 6, and it's not affected by this extreme value of 91. Properties of the median. The median is unique for a given set of data. It is unaffected by the presence of extreme values. For example, in this data set, the mean would be halfway between 6 and 7, which is 6.5. And if we added on an extreme value of 100, then this time the median would be 7, so it's changed a little bit, but it's not been affected by the fact that this value at the end is so big. Properties of the mean. The mean is unique for a given set of data. It is affected by the presence of extreme values because it incorporates every single data point. For example, in this set, the mean would be equal to the sum of all of these points divided by 8, which is 6.75. And if we added on an extra value of 100, the mean would be the sum of all of these values, including 100, divided by 9, which would be 17.11, which is much larger than 6.75, and obviously does not represent most of the data points. Measures of dispersion. Here we have two different samples. The mean of sample 1 is equal to the sum of all the points divided by how many there are which is the sum of all of these points divided by 8, which is 67. The mean of sample 2 can be calculated in the same way and gives us 67. So these samples have the same mean, but if we look at the actual values, the data is much more dispersed in sample 2. The values are more spread out and they range from a lower number up to a higher number. We're now going to look at ways of measuring dispersion. First of all, we'll look at the range. The range of a set of data is the difference between the largest and the smallest values in the set. So the range is equal to the largest value minus the smallest value. Here's an example. Find the range for these sample observations. The range is equal to the largest number, which is 25, minus the smallest number, which is 11. So it's 25 minus 11, which is 14. Here's another example. Find the range of the values given in the following table. This time, the range is the largest value, which is 23, because there's somebody here who had a value of 23, minus the smallest value, which is 7, because there were some people here that had a value of 7. So it's 23 minus 7, which is 16. Now we're going to have a look at standard deviation, which is another way of measuring dispersion. The variance, or delta squared, combines all the values in a data set to produce a measure of spread. It is the arithmetic mean of the squared differences between each value and the mean value. 
Let's have a look at that. First of all, we start with the differences between each value and the mean. This is because we're trying to find out how far away the data points are from the mean. We then square these differences to make sure that they're all positive, otherwise they would cancel each other out. Once we've got all of these squared differences for each value, we want to find what it is on average, so we find the arithmetic mean of these squared differences. The standard deviation is the square root of the variance and has the same unit as the data. The reason for taking the square root is to cancel out the fact that we had to square everything earlier on. Here's the definition again. Variance equals the mean of the squared differences between each value and the mean value. Here's an example. 30 farmers were asked how many farm workers they hire during a typical harvest season. Here are their responses. Calculate the mean and standard deviation for this data. The first thing we want to do is put it into a frequency table. So here are all the different numbers of workers from zero up to nine. And then here are the frequencies. So this means that one farmer hired no workers, one farmer hired one worker, two farmers hired two workers, and so on. And we can see that the total frequency is 30 because there were 30 farmers altogether. Now to find the mean, first of all, we want to find the sum of the frequencies times the values divided by the total frequency. So we'll make a column for the frequency times the values. So this is 0 times 1, 1 times 1, 2 times 2, 3 times 3, and so on. And the sum of these values is 150. So for the mean, we do 150 divided by 30, which is 5. Now for the standard deviation, what we want to do is find the squared differences between each value and the mean value. So we'll start by finding the differences. X represents the data point and X bar represents the mean. So these are the differences between the data points in this column here and the mean value of 5. So the first difference is negative 5, then negative 4, then negative 3, then negative 2, then negative 1, then 0, because actually in this case the value of X is equal to 5, and then 1, 2, 3, 4. You can see that some of these are negative and some of these are positive. So if we just added them up like this, then they'd cancel each other out. So we need to square them all to make sure that they're all positive. So we get 25, 16, 9, 4, 1, 0, 1, 4, 9 and 16. Now we want to find the arithmetic mean of these squared differences. So to do that, we add them all up and then we divide by the total frequency. So if we add them all up, first of all, we need to multiply them by the frequencies, just like when we were finding the mean. Because in this case, there was one farmer who had a squared difference of 25, one farmer who had a squared difference of 16, two farmers who had a squared difference of 9, giving 18, and so on. So if we add up the total for this column, we get 152, and then we can do 152 divided by the total frequency, which is 30. So this gives us 5.07. This is the variance. To find the standard deviation, we need to take the square root of this, which gives us 2.25. How adding and multiplying affect the arithmetic mean? Prove that if you add or subtract a constant value k to all the numbers in a list, the arithmetic mean increases by k. To do this, we'll say that the numbers in the list are x1, x2, x3, and so on up to xn, and we'll let x bar be the mean. So if we add k to all the values, then the list becomes x1 plus k, x2 plus k, x3 plus k, and so on up to xn plus k. So to find the new mean, we add together all of these new values and then divide by n. But we can see that in this sum here, we now have a lot of k's. And if we separate all of these out, we find that actually we've got x1 plus x2 plus x3 up to xn plus n lots of k, all divided by n. And this is equal to the sum of all of the x values divided by n plus nk over n 
which is equal to the original mean x bar plus k. So we've shown that actually the arithmetic mean also increases by k. The same works for subtraction, and in this case k is just negative. Prove that if you multiply or divide all the numbers in a list by a constant value k, the arithmetic mean is also multiplied by k. Again, let x bar be the mean of the numbers in the list, which are x1, x2, x3, up to xn. Then the list becomes x1k, x2k, x3k, up to xnk, because all the values have been multiplied by k. Now if we find the new mean, we need to add together all of these new values and divide by n. And we can factor out k to the front to get that the new mean is equal to k times the sum of the original list divided by n, which is equal to the original mean multiplied by k. So the arithmetic mean has also been multiplied by k. The same works for dividing, because if we divide by k, that's the same as multiplying by 1 over k. How adding and multiplying affect standard deviation? Prove that if you add or subtract a constant value k to all the numbers in a list, the standard deviation remains the same. We'll let x bar be the mean, delta be the standard deviation, and we'll let the numbers in the list be x1, x2, up to xn. Then the list becomes x1 plus k, x2 plus k, all the way up to xn plus k, because we've added k to all the numbers. We saw before that the new mean is equal to the old mean plus k. And now the new variance is equal to the squared differences of the new values from the new means. So for example, for the first one, the new value is x1 plus k, and the new mean is x bar plus k. So we find the difference of these values and then square it. But if we expand this out, then this is actually x1 plus k minus x bar minus k, and the k's actually cancel each time. So the new variance is just equal to the squared differences of the original values from the original means. So the new variance is actually equal to the old variance, which means that the new standard deviation is equal to the old standard deviation. The same works for subtracting, and in this case, k is just negative. Prove that if you multiply or divide all the numbers in the list by a constant value k, then the standard deviation is multiplied by k. Let x bar and delta be the mean and standard deviation of the list, and the list be x1, x2, up to xn. Then the list is going to become x1k, x2k, all the way up to xnk. And the new mean is equal to the old mean multiplied by k. The variance is equal to the sum of the squared differences between the values and the mean. So now the new variance is going to be equal to the sum of the squared differences of the new values from the new mean. So for example, for the first term, it would be x1k minus x bar k. But if we factor out k from this, then the new variance is equal to k squared multiplied by the squared differences of the old values minus the old mean. And if we factor out k from the whole of the numerator, then the new variance is equal to k squared multiplied by the squared differences of the original values minus the original means all added together. So the new variance is equal to k squared times the old variance, which means that the new standard deviation is equal to k times the old standard deviation. And the same works for dividing. In this case, dividing by k would be the same as multiplying by 1 over k. To summarise, if you add or subtract a constant value k to or from all the numbers in a list, the arithmetic mean increases or decreases by k, but the standard deviation remains the same. If you multiply or divide all the numbers in the list by a constant value k, both the arithmetic mean and the standard deviation are multiplied or divided by k.